in the last episode, we talked about how uh, Henry Bombrook justifies his arrival in England and his insurrection against Richard II. Um, we spoke about a um, horrifying image that uh, mixed both John of Gaunt's, Bolingbroke's, and Richard's notions of England that are turned into a bloody civil war. And you, again, um, you have to remember that this series is the second tetralogy. It is the um, prequel to the first tetralogy, which is made up of Henry the Sixth, one, two, and three, as well as um, the famous masterpiece Richard the Third. So always be aware that um, everything in the Henriad, everything from Richard the Second to Henry the Fifth, is supposed to explain and prefigure what will happen in Henry the Sixth, one, two, and three, and Richard the Third. It is the best prequel ever written. Let's put it that way. So let's look at Northumberland. Northumberland, um, he appears in the next play as well, in Henry IV, part one. He's going to be, in that play, he will be Henry IV's enemy. Now, his son, Hotspur, will lead a rebellion against Henry IV. Now, Hotspur is the Percy who shows up in Richard II. He shows up a couple times. He makes a few appearances. Uh, if you ever watch the TV series Age of Kings, um, it's very funny because if you're not you know, clear on what's going on, Percy and Hotspur, they're just like names. But um, Sean Connery, James Bond, this was one of his early, in one of his early films. And suddenly James Bond is in the background in the Richard II uh, film. And that's when you start to realize, ah, and then, and then of course in Henry IV, Sean Connery's the star because Hotspur is a great, great, I would say comical character. In fact, we get to see a little bit of his comedy, almost like a preview to the next film, to next Henry IV, part one. When Henry is concerned about his son, Hal, who will also be a star of the next film, he doesn't know where his son is. And Percy uh, has a funny response. Percy, my lord, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of these triumphs held at Oxford. Bolingbroke, and what said the gallant? Percy, his answer was, he went into the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favor, and with that he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a funny little joke because what he's saying basically is he's, Bombrook is being ironic. How's the gallant? How's my son, the gallant? And Percy's basically saying that um, he found him in the stews, the brothels, and from a prostitute, he plucked a glove and is wearing it as a favor. So remember, um, knights always wear um, some sort of clothing article of clothing for their lady is some sort of good luck charm or to prove that they're the champions of a lady so basically his lady is uh, a prostitute it, i mean it's funny because you have to always remember when you start reading henry the fourth part one that percy who will be called hotspur in the next play is a very funny guy so anyway uh percy's father actually repeats Henry's justifications to Richard. Remember, at this stage, he is Henry's ally right now. Northumberland, the king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth humbly kiss thy hand. And by the honorable tomb he swears that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, and the royalties of both your bloods, 
currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the varied hand of warlike Gaunt, and by the worth and honor of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal party granted once. His glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince and just, and, I, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him. The thing about this play and why it's so curious is the way Henry isn't ever true to himself, right? Even that phrase, lineal royalties, implies somehow his position behind Richard in terms of legitimacy to the throne, right? If Richard has no child, which he doesn't, right? He would be next in line as son of the only surviving child of one of Edward III's surviving sons. So throughout the play, Henry is constantly making claims that seem to conceal from himself, from his own intents, that would be Mowbray's claim, from his own guilt, that would be like the son, uh, you know, his motives are always shady, right? It's, it's as if, I mean, does, does Henry have any self-awareness, any self-consciousness? Does the sun ever shine on Henry so that his sins will be clear? I mean, that's a question we have to think about. Did the usurpation begin with his own father, John of Gaunt? Remember, John of Gaunt was angry about Henry's exile, and he has, does have the conversation with Gloucester's widow. John of Gaunt, in Q1, commands Henry to relieve the shock of his six years of exile by diminishing Richard II's legitimacy. Now, the problem is it's not in your edition, but it can be found in Q1. Let me show it to you. Um, we can't use the computers anymore like we used in class, but I do have this great book that I bought a while back. It collects all of the quartos together in one little copy like this. So let's look at Q1 Richard II. This uh, page in the first quarto coincides with the folios, Act 1, Scene 3, Lines. 277 to 80. This is what John of Gaunt says. And it would be much clearer if we'd used the digital uh, facsimiles, but this is a book facsimile. All the places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man, and notice that the, the little, it's not an F, it's not wife man, it's wise man. Remember, those are the long S's that we saw when we looked at uh, the, the Q1 Hamlet. All the places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. And what about the king? What is his reaction to this meeting with Bolingbroke? All he can do is rely on his status as sacred and royal, and he does it in a very angry manner. Richard to Northumberland below. We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not... Show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know, no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our scepter, unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, 
Yet no, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot, that lift your vassal hands against my head, and threat the glory of my precious crown. That, that speech is a lord speaking to a vassal. I mean, the opening line with his, we are amazed and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee. What he's saying is, is I can't believe that I've stood here this long and you haven't kneeled down yet. And of course, Henry does at that moment. But what makes the play so great is Richard's fear. Like for all that bluster about God's aid, um, he doesn't know if it's actually going to happen. And there's a great moment when, uh, uh, right afterwards, when he reveals his fear and it's filled with anaphores. That's the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of the line. Zugma, remember Zugma is a one verb, governs an entire passage. Anadiplosis, that's one line, ends with a word, and that word is picked up again at the beginning of the next line. Epizusis, remember that's a repetition without space. And antistrophe, those are repetitions at the end of the line, the opposite of anaphor. It's a, it's a full, um, a pathetic, overwrought, moving uh, discourse about his fears. Scene 23, O'Merrill. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. Richard. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? God's name let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an almsman's gown, my figured goblets for a dish of wood, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave, where I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head, for on my heart they tread now whilst I live, and buried once, why not upon my head? Let me show you more closely those figures of rhetoric that add such emotion to Richard's resignation. What must the king do now? Must he submit? This must, must is anaphor across the clause. The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose? That must and must and must become mesodiplosis. The king, the king is anaphor. The name of a king, name of king, God's name, let it go. I'll give, beginning the verb, my jewels for a set of beads. And then we get a string of anaphores. Remember, he's just giving things up. My scepter for a palmer's walking staff, right? He's going to become a hermit. He's going to become a pilgrim. And my little kingdom for a little grave. And here's the anadiplosis. A little, little grave with epizusis here, little, little and an obscure grave, and grave, grave is antistrophe. Richard's uh, self-representation as a saint or a martyr helps explain how he practically gives up the throne. In the next episode, we will focus on fortune's wheel. All right, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.